More than three million Canadians trace some of their family tree back to Germany. And it shows particularly in places such as the Kitchener-Waterloo area of Ontario. With us for more, in Waterloo, Ontario, Harry Drum. He is president of the German-Canadian Professional and Business Association there and a member of the executive for the Cooperative Council of German-Canadian Clubs of Waterloo Region. And Harry, it's nice to meet you. How are you doing tonight? Thank you. Nice to be with you. Well, tell me this. You know, obviously lots of people have known that there's been a strong German community uh, probably going back 200 years uh, in southern Ontario and in Waterloo in particular. How come? Uh, basically, uh, it happened because uh, the first settlers here came from Pennsylvania. They were Pennsylvania Germans. And once they got established here, they, you know, they let their, their brethren know back where they came from, how things were here. And from there, basically, the word spread out to, to Germany and, and, and Europe, uh, where there are also big colonies of, of, of German, uh, German settlers in there as well, too. So. And what were they trying to leave behind uh, in Pennsylvania or in other places? Well, I think Pennsylvania was just a matter of the things got a bit tighter, so they wanted to move where there was more and more land. But in Europe itself, I mean, uh, it was a constant state of, of uh, you know, war, uh, economic or, or social uh, upheaval, turmoil. And, uh, you know, they were looking for uh, peace and quiet and basically being able to, uh, you know, practice their trades and, uh, you know, make a living without, uh, without fear and, and disruption of, of things they'd work for. And I guess when a community gets established, it serves as a kind of a magnet for, for future Germans to come who want to be with with people like them. Yeah, I, I, I think the expression, the birds of the feather flock together. Hmm. So uh, uh, you can find that in other communities elsewhere too, uh, but you know, the Germans are no different in that. And basically they want to come and, and be among their own because it's, it's a matter of uh, being in a comfort zone and being able to speak your language initially uh, and uh, having the you know, same values. Gotcha. I want to read you an excerpt now. This is from a piece in Maclean's magazine on Germans settling in Ontario, and this was written in 1908. It says, wherever he is found, he is industrious, thrifty, enterprising, and economical characteristics of the men who have won distinction in various lines of endeavor. So this, no, this notion of German industriousness, this really does go back a long time, doesn't it? Uh, I think it's 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 uh, it's a genetic trait that, that the Germans have and can't 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 seem to get rid of. So it's just in their DNA. Can you give us uh, maybe a couple of examples of German companies that have settled in the Waterloo area that we would know? Well, big ones would be uh, like you know Schneiders. Um, there are all kinds of other smaller smaller companies. I think here too recently like Pillars Sausage and Delicatessens, which is a huge a huge company. Uh, there are, um, you know, Bud Automotive, which used to be owned by Thyssen Krupp out of, out of out of Germany, and there are all kinds of, you know, medium and, and small sized businesses, and you can identify them by the fact that they still have their their German names, which haven't changed over the over the years. Okay, let's talk about German uh, cultural clubs, which have helped, I guess, new immigrants who have come to Canada and Southern Ontario in particular. German immigration is, is today nothing like what it would have been in years past. And I wonder how these cultural organizations, which have been established in the Waterloo area for so many years, how do you think they're going to survive with less and less immigration coming? Well, I think the first thing is we do have critical mass uh, in that there's enough you know, Canadians of German background in the, in the area here. So we have four, four major clubs. Um, that basically you know, promote the German culture, uh, language as best as they can, and all their other traditions. But as they as they go uh, go uh, forward, um, you know the next, the second, and third generations now may not speak as much German or maybe no German at all. But they still have the cultural background, and, and the fact is that in in the homes that they grew up with, there there uh, is is uh, you know, there are those German. German habits and, and traits and then, and, and, you know, things all German that, that, that they do. And this kind of just, it, it'll help, it'll help just to, 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 to carry out, carry on the traditions. I know that there are lots of other clubs and organizations, German ones around Ontario uh, that basically have folded over the years simply because they didn't have the critical mass. Hmm. That's interesting. If you look at the G and GTA area, there's probably more German Canadians there than there are in Waterloo County. But the fact is that they're all, concentrated within, you know, 
let's say, uh, 10 or 20 minutes uh, driving distance of one another. Right. Now, I know, for example, during the Olympics or during the World Cup, uh, these places would be highly popular places for people to come and gather and, you know, watch what we call soccer, I guess what they call in Germany football. But beyond that, what kinds of activities take place at these clubs? Uh, they, they have, uh, I mean, number one, a lot of them will have regular dances that goes on a, a couple of times a year. Uh, where there, you know, there will be serving the eth the ethnic foods. There will be, uh, you know, a band that uh, plays predominantly German, you know, German music. So that's kind of it. Now they also have uh, other, you know, activities. They may have like a, a bowling club, uh, a, a an archery, uh, you know, uh, uh, club. Many different things that are are, are said German horseshoe pitching, what, whatever the specialty of, of of the club is. Gotcha. Now, Harry, I don't know. Do you have a family? Yes. Do you talk to your kids in German? Uh, yes, we actually, uh, we were lucky that my, our Oma lived with us for, for many years, so there was always that element of having to speak German. But then, like many people in Waterloo County will, will recount about the fact that while their, 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 their friends were watching cartoons on Saturday morning, uh, the, all of us were, were herded off to go to German school to learn German. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I, and I thought, our kids had no problem with that, and to this day, I mean, they're they're good good Canadians, but they've got those German roots, and uh, they, they they like to travel and they like things that are German within within the Canadian context. And how much do you think of that is still going on in other German families? In other words, how important is it to keep the language and the and the culture and the customs going? It, it becomes more and more difficult. I mean, my wife is of German background, so that makes it easy. As soon as one partner is not, uh, you know. Of a German background, it becomes uh, it becomes more difficult. It's easier when the mother is a is is a, a German speaker because in the, when we talk about the mother tongue, uh, because you spend tend to spend more time with your mother, so you pick up uh, you know, the language uh, at the side of the crib or you know uh, at, at the t at the table. So um, yeah, it's 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 it, it becomes more difficult uh, with with each successive generation. But subtly underneath. You know there are still those 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 roots and, and the traits uh, and characteristics that uh, they kind of can't can't really get rid of. They're just mm -hmm. part of their DNA. Now, Harry, this is a bit awkward to bring up, but you know, I mean, it's just it's a reality. It's part of history. Uh, Germany and Canada fought two world wars against one another, and of course, it was more than a hundred years ago that that Kitchener used to be called Berlin and had its name changed because, of course, there was a great deal of anti-German sentiment in Canada, and in particular in that part of Ontario at the time. Um, what, maybe you could tell us a bit about what kinds of um, pressures Germans felt, German Canadians felt, living in Canada during wartime. Um, I mean, if I look at Waterloo County, you know, we are part of you know, the you know, British North America, but the, the, uh, the Germans were actually a majority in this area here but you know the uh, say the, the the ruling people or the the government people tended to be more you know British oriented. So basically, what happened was that in most cases the Germans kind of like just uh, sort of uh, took a low profile and didn't try to to raise anything. So that was the first world war. I think the sentiment was a lot bigger. When the second world war came around, uh, the government basically told or asked uh, you know German clubs, organizations, churches that that held services in German. To uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, shut what they were doing uh, and and wait for uh, at some other, some other time, and they basically did that. They basically took a very low profile. I can relate to that to my 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 sister in law who is a, is a you know older older than me that who was born in in, in the Second World War, and uh, you know she wasn't given a, a German name. Uh, she was given an English name, and. Uh, they dared not speak uh, a, a German outside of the house just simply because they wanted to keep a low profile. But the other thing you got to remember here too is, is mo so many of the Germans that came to this area were not just from, from Germany, but they were from, from Eastern Europe, Central Europe, uh, and uh, uh, they were being kind of lumped together with you know, what was happening in the Third Reich, which they themselves probably had never, you know, ne never lived in, but uh, you know, they were tired with the same brush. So. Uh, best to kind of just keep a low profile. And then once the war was over, by the late 40s, things started to pick up again. And, you know, the immigration came and then, you know, the, the you know, reactivating of, of German activities, the, the German clubs, etc. Harry, I'm going to ask you one last question. And again, it might be a bit of an odd question, but 
Berlin got its name changed to Kitchener in the first place because of this anti-German sentiment. But as time has gone on, we've learned a few things about the Earl of Kitchener that don't really stand the test of time either. So I wonder whether you think there is any kind of a move afoot to have Kitchener renamed Berlin as it once was. Well, there was actually uh, from our association a number of years ago, we toyed with, 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 with the idea because, for example, in the United States, I think there's something like, like 18 Berlins uh, that they never changed uh, the name. They just simply changed the pronun pronunciation from Berlin to Berlin. Uh, things, things were okay. I know that there, the recently there was a, a, a petition that was going around by a fellow in, in our community here saying, well, let's change it back to Berlin because of the negative connotations that, uh, that Kitchener had. But I think people have gotten so used to it uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, the cost of changing things, whatever, be, be, would be quite, quite uh, you know, horrendous. But, uh, you know, here, uh, Kitchener was the hero at the time and, uh, you know, it seemed... Uh, an appropriate name to, to, to choose to, to replace to replace uh, uh, Berlin. Gotcha. Harry Drung, it's awfully good of you to spend so much time with us here on TVO tonight. Thanks so much, and Vita Zane. Well, Vita Zane, thank you for taking the time. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.